you guys are ready already. It's awesome. You know what you're doing. So we're going to continue with an attitude of gratitude. Um, we're going to sing some familiar songs. We sang a few of them last week, but uh, I want you guys to just get warmed up, right? This is high energy songs. We can burn off some of those calories if you want to jump around the room. Let's get into it this morning, amen. Wandering through the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This back home, and I've tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. My soul is drifting, vagabond. Just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. Pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because He healed. No choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends, burden and bitterness. You can just keep it moving. You're not welcome here. From now till I walk, the streets will flow. I'll sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back.
are my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in you and you help me. And with my song I give thanks. With my song I give thanks. And I'm so grateful that you are so faithful. You are my Savior strong and true. Yes, you are. Oh, I'm so grateful that you are so faithful.
adore you, Jesus. We say in all of you, Jesus. put ourselves in a place to remind ourselves that he has conquered fear he has conquered death he has already done these things and we just gotta be in the presence so that we can remember everything that he's already done and what he's, he's going to do in our lives Amen. So I pray that you guys would sing this with boldness today surrounding me let it break at your name and stay. call the seas to stay the wave in me to stay let it break at your name Jesus Jesus as you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus, you silence fear. Come on. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus.
Your name is alive at the shadows. Come on, do you believe that this morning? Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive forever. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. One more time, your name. Your name is alive that the shadows can't deny. Your name. over every fear, over all darkness, Jesus, you have the power. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you have granted us your peace. We thank you that your peace is a gift, Lord God, and it's your peace. It's not the world's peace. It's your peace, and we thank you, Jesus. We thank you. Let it guard our hearts, Jesus. We thank you for your great peace that surpasses all understanding, Jesus. Lord God, grant us your peace in every situation, in every circumstance, Lord God, where it seems like you're not there, where it seems like you're taking too long to fix something. God, all we need is you. We don't need what we think we need. We just need you, Jesus. Help us to know that, Lord God. Help us to believe that. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you that we get to come together as a congregation and just thank you for who you are. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. In your precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're just going to give you a few announcements now. For that, everybody enjoy their Thanksgiving. It's a great day, right? It's always a great day to be thankful to God and all that he's done for us. Uh, So just a couple of announcements. We want to give a big shout out to our outreach team. Uh, Yesterday we were able to bless over 200 families that was really awesome yeah and that consisted of those that drove through we had the opportunity to pray for some families those that drove through uh, meals were delivered to homes of people that couldn't get out in the local area we were able to go to the veterans homes we were able to go to the women's uh, apostle house we were able to go to an assisted living facility next to agape and bless 40 uh, families there So, you know, God is doing a great thing, you know. You know, we're the hands and feet of Jesus. And Jesus said, as you do unto others, it's as if you're doing it unto me. So that's a great, great feeling. So big shout out to those that volunteered and braved the cold yesterday and our outreach team. It was really pretty special. 
Uh, so the, coming up this week, you have your bulletins. You can verify all of that in your bulletin. Uh, we have our Celebrate Recovery uh, that's going to be happening on Thursday at 7.30. And if you have hurts, hang-ups, and habits, or anything that you're unable to shake, this is the place to be. You'll be welcomed warmly. There's a lot of love in this ministry. Uh, so please, come out Thursday, 7.30. Friday, 7.30 as well. Women, the wow, wow ladies, right? Women of worth, women of warfare, women of worship, women of whatever, right? <laughs> so you need to be out here uh, this coming week, all right? Amen? A uh, lot, of, lot of stuff happening. You can check your bulletins. And it was really a great day yesterday. Amen? So where's Pastor? Is he coming out? Yeah, here he is. Good to see you. Kind of uh, as we move forward into this year, it's hard to believe that we're at the end of this year, isn't it? Uh, it's uh, when you look at it, it's like wow, here we are here, <laughs> ready to go into another year and. Um, I'm excited that, you know, God's got more things in store. I really believe that. Um, two things I want to just quickly just mention before we dive right into the message this morning. And, and that is, uh, first, I just want to thank you for, for your, your support of this ministry over this year. It has been a challenge for so many churches, uh, you know, across the nation. I was, a couple weeks ago, I was in a, a pastor's conference meeting. It was a small one with about 50, 60 people, pastors, uh, men and women from across the, the country mentioned about it. I think the other week I mentioned that. But uh, it was amazing to hear that we all have such similar stories that, it, you know, what uh, that we as a church have, you know, went through and the challenges we had, it's happening, it's happened all across the country. So, we're in, which I was kind of glad to also hear that we weren't the only one, uh, you know, which, you know, but the fact is with all with the attitudes and the pr things to move forward and see God do greater and bigger things because he's not done yet, you know, COVID doesn't have the last word, the pandemic doesn't have the last word. Uh, it made some shifts, it made some changes, it made some alterations, but you know what, as the church, as the body of Christ, we move forward and the church of Jesus Christ is not immune to to things that happen around us and you go through history you see the church has gone through so many different things it's no different we're moving forward so I want to thank you for your support your volunteering your support and in, in uh, praying and standing and helping in so many different ways your giving uh, this past year has helped us uh, just to be able to do the projects continue to uh, be able to support the ministries that we support to do the things that we need to do, like the basics of keeping the light, the heat, the air, and all those things on. Uh, and thank God we, we, you know, we drastically cut budget. We cut out a lot of things that we just haven't, just to save, we, we, being wise. I think we always have to be wise stewards in what God calls us to do. Um, and so I just want to share just for a few moments of some of the things that we're wanting to move forward with. And one is first, you know, as, we, as we're coming to the end of this year, what I would like to challenge our church to do, and that means me and, and you also, um, to, to take the opportunity to pray and ask God, what could you do in whatever situation, whether you're little or much, to be able to help us just get through some steps that we need to do? We are under budget this year, which we knew that that was going to happen. Um, and so what happens is this coming year, we're wanting to do a project. And I think it's a very vital project. So we need to, two things in that sense is we have to, we want to close the gap where we need to be financially so that we are moving forward debt-free, amen? amen? But also have the opportunity to take some steps to really do something within our children's ministry. Uh, one of the challenges that we had, we've had challenges downstairs with our kids' ministry, we just have a small space and all these kind of scenarios has been a challenge. Uh, we are looking to move our nursery, getting nursery and preschool back shortly um, and then as quick as we can get something with Kids Church moving. We understand that's a big deal and thank you for your patience with that. It has been challenged because we lost a lot of our volunteers. Some people are just not ready to come back yet. Uh, some leaders that we need, some things have to be organized. You can't just throw kids in a room and say, see you later. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> You gotta have people, and you gotta have volunteers, and you gotta things have you know things work. So, so we're we're in that scenario, and so I'll just throw that little thing in there too. If you're interested in any of those capacities, you're more than welcome to talk to our blue room, and they'll connect you up. Okay, but one of the things we want to do is the house that's right next to the building, the house that's right next to the church here. We're looking to change that and turn that into um, for our kids ministry. We we look, we know we've looked at it. We think uh, we can some things that we can do to it. We still have to see an architect. We have had a, a contractor tell us a little bit about, get some ideas and things that we can do to turn it into a facility to be able to help for our kids' church and up. So our preschool and nursery would be, still be in this building, but for those older kids to be able to utilize there. We think it's a great fix at the moment. 
we all know that we're always out of room. We've been out of room. We were out of room before the pandemic. And uh, so we're, you know, we, we know as we get things back, uh, it will be a help, but it's a big start. So, but right now we're at a point we don't have the extra funds to even look into it right now, but we know, but God is able. And so what I'm asking you to do, if, if you would, is just pray about it. Okay, we're not taking up a special offering. We're not making a big deal about it. But if you could say, okay, with all your giving and the things that you're doing, would you consider investing into the ministry and whatever you're able to do, little or big, above and beyond what you normally do? And that will help us close this gap. That will help us be able to talk to the architects to do the things we need to do, to be able to get those things in motion so that we can begin to get that going forward as fast as we can. We know that God is able to do it. I, I, our kids are important. Our ch children's ministry has always been a, a major part uh, of Oasis. Um, and w like to not have that the where we want it to be, man, it is, it's painful for, for me personally as well as our staff. And so um, I'm just, just leaving it in your hands today. Pray about it. I'll talk about it the next few weeks as we go through this month. But it's no pressure on that. You know we don't do that here. It's between you and God. Ask him what you can do. And I just ask you to take the step of faith and say, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. And no, one's, no one's twisting your arm. We're not going to pass the buckets five times to get that. We don't play those games. Amen? Amen? There's no manipulation here. I say we just take it, run with it, pray about it. Let God speak to your heart. And let's, and, and of course, pray. We need, we need the workers, we need the ability so that we can take and, and get a nice and, and do what we can with what we have. And I think that's the thing. Sometimes you go, oh, it'd be nice to have, I, listen, I'd love to have a bigger building, love to have all the fancy stuff, but we have what we have. And we're gonna be faithful with what we have and let God take it from there, amen? So leave that with you. Let's get right in the word this morning, amen? You guys good? All right, hey, you know, uh, so we hope you had a thanks good nice Thanksgiving. Hope you didn't eat turkey last night and be falling asleep on me this morning. Um, but anyways, um, it is a good day. You know, we're going into this Christmas season. You look at it and, it's, uh, and see all the things that are involved in it. It's busy. It's hectic. And I know I'm sure sometime this, this week we're going to be pulling out the decorations and trying to find a tree and all the stuff like that. But, you know, when we look at the things that we've gone through as a nation, as a world, and, you know, friends that I've talked to, do in different, talked to in different countries and hear what they're going through, you know, fear really has been a reality over the last couple of years in so many people's lives and families and situations and circumstances. Fear is a, a reality that we all are confronted with, whether it's the breaking, daily breaking news that sometimes I don't want to hear and read and listen to, uh, or whether it's the financial stability on having what you need to be able to pay the bills and do the stuff that you need to do, whether it's insecurities of in being insi feeling insignificant in your job or as a parent or uh, as a student or whatever the case may be and that we struggle with in those scenarios, um, whether it's potential health conditions or future or retirement or marriage or friends, whatever it may be, it's those fears that, that really battle to rule our life. So fears that, that we don't talk about, we don't put it out there. And I've been listening to a, a book, and I, I would strongly suggest it. It's by Chris Hodges. He pastors, pastors Highland Church in Alabama, and it's called Out of the Cave. Uh, I've been listening to it to help me just in my journey in the struggles that I've had over the last couple of years that I've been very open with as far as just you know, PTSD and all the different stuff that, that I've kind of gone through. And man, it was, it, was a, it, was, it was great listening to him. But having, here's this guy that I know is pastors a huge church, uh, and to hear him talk about his insecurities and his struggles and how that, you know, Satan tried to take him out with it, yet how that God is working in his life. And I'd say if you, uh, definitely, if you, I'd say just get it and listen to it or read it in anyways, because it's, it's, an, it's an amazing book, and I'm in the middle of it going back the second time now listening to it all over again. Um, but the things that we, we all deal with insecurities, and anybody that tells you, oh, no, I don't have any, I just have a hard time believing that. Maybe they're perfect. I don't know, but uh, I don't run into any, many people that are perfect that have it all together. Okay. Amen? And so there are those fears that try to play on those things, to rule our life. In fact, and we're talking about Christmas, the very first Christmas, you know, we see these words mentioned four times, fear not. You see the angel telling Mary, fear not. You see the angels uh, telling Joseph, fear not. The shepherds, fear not. Zechariah, the, the priest, the, uh, to, to fear not. All of those major players in the, in the Christmas story, and we see God saying it four times, don't be afraid. You know, for us, when we look at the Christmas story and the birth of Jesus, um, 
it's good news. We're talking, we celebrate good, good news and proclaiming good news. And, and, and it is absolutely, that's the case. But those that were hearing this story for the very first time, the announcement of Jesus or what was taking place, to them, it was a little scary. It was a little challenging or just right out like, wow, really? <laughs> we don't think of it that way, but that proclamation, I believe it was, it was more than just saying, wow, you're an angel. I'm kind of afraid of you. It was, it was, it was what was called what was called of them to do the the step of faith that they were going to the interruption of God stepping into their plans when the angels say hey fear not don't be afraid because God's got this I know it's going to be a big thing a big ask that I'm going to give you right now but don't, don't be afraid of it God is with you you're not alone see it, it wasn't just the fact of wow that's a big angel that's kind of scary I wasn't expecting you to pop in today <laughs> But the message that he was giving was a message that was so much bigger than maybe that initial shock of the angel, you know, there. The fact of fear not, you know, when the wise men go and they tell King Herod about Jesus' birth, the scripture says this in Matthew 2, verses 1 through 3. Jesus was born in Bethlehem near, near Jerusalem during the reign of King Herod. After Jesus' birth, a group of spiritual priests from the east came to Jerusalem, that's the wise men, and inquired of the people, um, where is the child who is born king of the Jews? We observed his star rising in the sky and we've come to bow before him in worship. King Herod was shaken to the core when he heard this and not only he, but all of Jerusalem was disturbed when they heard this news. That's quite interesting when you, think, when you take it a little bit further. It wasn't just the king. This, this news of Jesus being born... See, Jesus is, is, is at the time of his birth, there's, there's, like, there's turbulent times that were taking place, political upheavals, all kinds of situations that were going through. It was not a calm, peaceful time period in history when, when all of a sudden God drops Jesus in the middle of mankind. There's political things, there's all these pressures and all these things that are taking place at this time and the king hears this and we know that he's upset he goes out and he sends a decree out to kill all the babies under two years old throughout all Bethlehem and the entire region he's trying to secure his kingdom because he's afraid that this birth of this king is going to take undermine his authority and his rule or his reign or his son's reign after that and so what we see is that even all of Jerusalem is, is, is gripped by the fear and so but the fact is, is that we're not called to be filled with fear. No matter what's driving the fear, no matter what's around us, what situation, whether it's a, a COVID thing or, or the new variant or this thing or the financial thing or the stock market drop, I mean, all this stuff, you're like, if you read all that, you'll just live in fear. Just put yourself in a box, lock the key and just go in a closet somewhere. That's not who we're called to be. We're called to stand in the midst of no matter what the situation is, what the circumstances is. I know Pastor Chris posted something the other day, and it was really good. He had it on his uh, Instagram. I'm, I meant to like read it, but it was talking about all the things that, that should have wiped us out and killed us. You're, all these different years, and yet we're still here. You know, oh no, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. We're gonna, all these things are going to happen. And he's been going back, I forgot, 10, 20, it was more than that, years he had. And it was, it was really, really good. Cause, yes, because God is good because he sees us through. He's not done. He's not done with you yet. He's not done with us yet. He's not done with the church of Jesus Christ yet. And so when we understand this, you know, um, that, that we understand that fear should not be the thing that rules our life. And uh, have you ever been to the circus and you ever watched the tightrope walk walkers? I mean, that always amazed me. Like, how do they, how do, they do that? I, I, you know, I remember we went to Ringling Brothers Ball and Baby Circus. Was the, I think one of the last ones that were in, in, in New York, I believe it was. Oh, no, it was the last one there, but uh, there's, there's one ringmaster that was really, really good. He'd been there for many, many years, and it was his last time. I got to meet him, which was pretty cool, because we were down there. It was Leslie, myself, and Brittany, who was about mm, two and a half years old at that time, and we go there. went to the early, the pre-show. You can go down. You can be on the bottom and see everything and all this kind of stuff. So we get down there, and someone walks up to her, and she she goes, hey, would you like to be part of the opening act? And she's like, sure. I'm like, what, what did you, what did they just ask you? And I was like, she, <laughs> she's like, she's like, oh yeah, you'd like to be part, you know, she goes, yeah, they asked me we'd be part of the act. You know, maybe he's like a clown thing or something like that. I'm like, did you ask what the opening act is? And she's like, no, I didn't ask. And like literally seconds later, here comes the legal person out with all the documents that I have to sign. And they're like, sign here. And someone else has got this like contraption that you, they're like, step into this. I'm like, uh, like, what am I stepping into? And they put me in this harness and they put her in this harness. And I'm like, we have our two and a half year old daughter right here. They're like, well, okay, we got her. We'll have her over here. We'll be with her. She's fine. And they get us strapped up. I'm like, what are we doing? 
I just signed all the paper. I didn't, I couldn't read them because it's like, just sign here, you know? And literally it was like one of those legal mumbo jumbo ones It's about this long, all fine print. And basically it says, if you die, we can't help it. You know, it's kind of that kind of thing. And so they go, and here we go. We, we, they get us to think, okay, what you're going to do as they're walking us to the center ring. So what you're going to do, we're going to hoist this thing up there. We're going to pull you up. You're going to sit on top of one of the horses. And there's these like eight or 10 horses that come out. And they're those massive horses. And they're going to run around this ring. And you're going to be sitting on top of the horse. And halfway through, there's going to be a thing that you're going to do, a time that you see the, the, the lead person, when they stand up on the back of the horse, you stand up on the back of the horse. I'm like, what are you talking? I'm like, what am I doing here? I don't even, I mean, I'm pretty adventurous. But I like, there's a there's that logical part of my brain that says, before I sign a document, I want to know what I'm signing and I want to know what I'm getting into, okay? There was no moment, opportunity even to figure it out. Literally, it was the harness is on. We're walking you out, jump on this horse that's like this tall. I mean, I literally could, they had, to, I couldn't get on top of the horse and I've ridden lots of horses before. And they're like hoisting you up on one of those big old horses they have and they get checked up and they're okay, don't forget to stand up when you go around and then off we go. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding. So you know, I'm the first one before Leslie. Leslie's behind me and I get on top of the thing and I'm trying to balance and it's kind of like being on the tightrope, you know, and there's that fear and adrenaline all kicking in at the same exact time. And, you know, I, I'm like, oh my gosh. And like, there's a whole, there's like thousands of people watching. You make a fool out of yourself. Like, well, I'm not lying. And this is like, this really actually did happen. It's still like a blur, but it really did happen. And so we get up there, we're like, I'm like, okay, and I try to step up on the horse. And of course, I, you know, I step up and I'm wing, I went flying off and the rope catches and you swing off to the side. And then Leslie actually was able to get up and she stood for a couple minutes and then she, of course, fell off. And, and you know, it's all over. It was like in a flash. And we're like, what did we just do? And you got the adrenaline, the fear of, oh, and they, and they're like, what do we, you know, they're trying to figure it all out and all that thing kind of happening. And, and I, I remember in that moment, it was like, it was like when they told me that we, okay, just, you just got to stand up on the horse. And it was like, I can't stand up on a horse. But you're in the middle of the horses going around and, and so you just do it. And I remember I just pulled a good up and, you know, did it, whatever in the case like this. And, but there's that line, like a tightrope walker, that it's like that fear and, and the adrenaline and the, I, maybe I can do it, maybe I can't do it. All these things going back in our life. So maybe it's not a horse you're having to stand up on or a tightrope you're having to walk, but there's things in life that we always go through that, that are just kind of like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to balance this? How am I going to stand up when I need to stand up? How am I going to get to the other side? How, how is this all going to come together? Balancing enough to, you know, and, and many times we live our life like in this tightrope balancing act as Christians walking in our relationship with God. We're balancing enough to get God's blessing and favor, but trying not to get asked to surrender or give up something or do something for him. That committal part, signing the documents, you know, like, okay, I'm going to step up on the horse and I'm going to do this. And God challenges us to put the fear away because fear is faith in the wrong things. I'm placing my fear in things that, are, that I, I shouldn't be a fear of. We have a fear of what God is asking me to do. You know, it's, you know, God, is he gonna send me here? Is he gonna give me something? Do I have to give up something? Do I have to volunteer for something? Or you know, if I give my all to him, is my life really gonna turn out the way that he wants me, that I want it to be? Is he going to change it? Or, you know, that's, you know, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to sign on the bottom line there. The fear is faith, but it's in the wrong things. It's the, in the what if I, or the what if I don't, or what if they, or what if it. I'm placing my faith in the worst case scenarios. scenarios. You ever notice that that's usually what we do? You know, when, when, we're, when something is challenged, we never, it's, it's very rare that we look at it and say, wow, what an amazing opportunity. We're like, well, what if that happens? What if this happens? What if this, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And listen, I'm a very logical thinker. I, I think things through. I look at things logically. It's how I'm wired. And, you know, and, and I'm planning it out in my head and, you know, what steps to take. When I, you know, when I walk through a crowded, you know, whether amusement park or airport or whatever, I'm looking ahead, I'm planning, okay, I'm going to go, and I know it's kind of weird, but I'm just being kind of, I always 
probably tell way too much, but I have issues. I, I totally get I have issues. And, you know, but I go and I'm planning. I'm planning how to get through the line because I don't like lines. I don't like crowd, you know, being stuck in crowds. And so, you know, I've always, over all the years, I've always gotten my, tell my kids, hang on when they were little, hang on because here we go. And we'll just weave through. And, uh, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting on the other side because I don't want to be delayed. You know, we're going to, I've got things to do to get the other side. That's my goal. We're going to do it. But I plan it out. And there's just things in life you can't plan out. You can't see all the scenarios. You can't see all the steps and all the directions. And that's what faith is. Faith is this ability to step out and trusting that, God, you are able to do what you called me to do. That I, I, I'm, you know, for all the what ifs that bombard our mind constantly, 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind, a peaceful mind, a, a mind that is secure. And, and see, that's, that's the goal. It's that when, when my mind is secure and knowing, God, that you're gonna see me through, I'm gonna do it. And I have to say, after all these years, I, I look back and I, I, I can trust that God will do what he says he will do. And I have to fight that. It's that tightrope of, you know, like standing on the back of the horse, trying to, or just to stand up. Can I stand up and trust that God's got me? Or am I gonna fall over? I'm going to fall off or whatever. But this fact is that God, I've seen it over and over of how that he has done those things. So it builds trust. But that first time that you're actually stepping up for the first time, it's scary. The first time you say, well, can I really trust God? Is he really going to do this? Really going to do that? Is he really going to see me through in this situation? Is he able to see me through? And so that's that coming back to that part that God, you've not given me a spirit of fear. So fear is not going to rule my life. It's not going to rule my decision. It's not going to rule my choices. It's not going to rule this or that or whatever. But God, your power is a part. You see, it's those, sometimes we have to make those as affirmations in our life. And if, if fear is ruling your day, you need to get up in the morning. And, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 needs to be your affirmation of the day. Father, I thank you that I do not have a spirit of fear ruling my life today that you give me power you give me love and sound mind today for everything that I encompass for every decision that I make for every situation I go with every person that I talk to God you are the one that is leading me fear will not rule me you in your Holy Spirit will lead me today see there's things that we need to affirm in our life and declare in our life because there's so many things that, that bombard us constantly telling us the complete opposite we need to say what God says about the situation I mean, I honestly believe that if we would wake up in the morning and we'd say what God says about the day, every voice that comes to you, every thought that comes to you that is contrary to what God wants to do in your life cannot stand a chance because you've already made a decision. I talked about this last week. When you make a decision, how you're gonna handle the situation before the situation happens, you have the advantage. There's a strength for you to move forward in that. When I make the decision to say, God, no matter what comes today, I thank you, fear is not gonna rule my life, but I will have clarity, sound of mind in the decisions and choices that I make. Most of you know my life, you know this stuff, I'm very open with what we go through and I've gone through my family over and over and all that kind of stuff. Probably some of you could tell the story better than I could, <laughs> to be honest, because you've heard it so much. The fact is this, I look at that as how that God has got us through. And you know, I've heard someone say, wow, that's, you know, that's really a shame that you've had so many issues and things and challenges in your life. To me, it's just, it's called life. We all go through them. Different names, different things on them, different situations, and none of them really easy. But the fact that God is bigger than to able, and able to move us through and get us to the other side. And so that's the things I hold on. When, when that is what I'm holding till fear can't rule me. But today I want to just talk a little bit about the fact that the, the fear that, that, of what God is asking me to do. Because many times there's that fear, that hesitation, that when God challenges us to take a step, will we really take a step? You know, because the what is rule. And so why are we afraid of God's plans? We look at Mary here. Mary, because just use her as an example, because she had the opportunity to really be afraid of what the messenger just came and told her. That's a huge step for a young girl. You know, so the first thing we look at is that God's interruptions in our life are often inconvenient. I don't know if you ever noticed that. And sometimes, you know, you feel God leading you and something, a decision, sometimes it's inconvenience to forgive somebody, something just as basic and simple as that. Or maybe for some, it's like God, you know, is moving them to another state or another job or another, another something, another career that's totally different. And, and you, that you, you feel that that's the case, but you're like, this is inconvenient. It's not what I planned on. But you can't get past the fact that you know that you, that you know that you know that God has challenging you to take that step. 
In Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 29, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel announced to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused, and obviously confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. You have to th think about this. I don't think that Mary was a, was a bridezilla by no stretch of the imagination, but she is engaged to be married. Okay, so we have to put this in the perspective of what's going on. I mean, she is betrothed to Joseph. They, you know, they, she's engaged to be married in her culture. Once, uh, once a girl uh, hits puberty, she's betrothed to be married. So she's, as scholars believe, in the age, between the ages of 14 and 16, which sounds kind of crazy to us, but that was the culture of the day back then. And so she's no doubt excited about it. Joseph, you know, from what we see, just how he handled the situation later, he's a kind guy. He's a caring man. He's good. He's, he's trying to put her the benefit of protecting her first. We see that as the story goes on. So we, we see the nature of, the, of, of who he is. And, you know, she's thinking about all the stuff that any bride would be thinking about. She's thinking about what's his love language? What's his credit score? Uh, does he have a job? Um, is he in debt? Has he paid off his student loans? Okay, maybe not then, but today you should be thinking about some of those things is my opinion, okay? So anyways, in the middle of all her plans that she's doing, preparing, because she's engaged to be married, God sends Gabriel and interrupts her plans in the middle of that, and those plans are inconvenient for Mary. It's not on her, on her planning schedule. When we feel like God is inter interrupting our plans, he's often inviting us to something greater. But see, we can't see it. All we see, this is an interruption. This is not what I planned on. This is not what I expected. And, and so, but Mary, so she has all these plans, but her plans are abruptly interrupted. So what we see as an interruption, God sees as an invitation to something more. When you think about this, you see it in the scripture, God interrupted Moses. He ran far from God. He's on the backside of the desert, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. And he crosses, comes across this burning bush. Voice comes out of it. God speaks to him, inviting him to be the deliverer of his people from Egypt, get, to get them out of Egypt. That was an interruption of plans. Moses had no plan to go back to Egypt. He had a history in Egypt that wasn't very good. He could be killed. And this is an interruption to his plan. In the New Testament, Saul is killing and imprisoning Christians. And he has this encounter on the road to Damascus with Jesus where this light knocks him off his, his, his ride, his don donkey or horse, whatever that thing was he was riding. And here he, gets, he falls off it and God invites Saul to take a name change and call him Paul to become an apostle, apostle to take the gospel to the, the, the countries and the surrounding regions to establish churches and to write the majority of the New Testament. Going from Christian killer building churches, taking the message of the gospel, proclaiming Jesus around the known world at that time, and writing the majority of the New Testament. Huge interruption, total change of plans. You know, 35 years ago, this exact weekend, 35 years ago, this, this exact weekend, my, my father died of a massive heart attack. It was also the same weekend that God called me interrupted my plans to be a pilot, to work in a missionary organization, to move to Costa Rica for six months, to learn Spanish, all these kind of scenarios that I had, all these plans that I had to interrupt every plan that I had to invite me to pastor this church. Sometimes those plans that God calls you to is an interruption of your plans. But see, we can't see on the other side of what those plans are. There are many of us who ignore God's invitation, calling them interruptions to our plans when God just wants to do something bigger within our life. Maybe he's interrupting you today. Maybe, you know, maybe he interrupted you to come here today. 
You're like, I didn't want to go to that church. Some of you, that's exactly what it is. I've talked to people, so many of our, <laughs> our leaders and stuff like that, and that they, their story was the fact that, you know, they were driving by and they, they saw this, this church. They saw this sign. They saw the green Jesus. They saw all these kind of things that we have, you know, like, you know, if you've never noticed the stained glass window, Jesus is green in there, okay? So, which is a, you know. It's, you know, all these things, whatever it may be, for, you know, Mary, for Mary Collins, it was, a, it was an Easter blow-up six-foot, eight-foot bunny that we had outside, which was very strange. And how that God interrupted people's plans and they came here and God did something in their life and changed something in their life and they, they made a decision to follow Jesus. See, he interrupts our plans. He stops you. You know, there's so many people that have come and been a part of this church because they got stopped by that, that red light outside. We prayed, you know, for years, we've always prayed for that red light. God just stopped the right people at the right time. And the only thing they can look at is us or the apartments on the other side of the street. So either if they're looking for our apartment, maybe they'll find one over there. But if they wanted a God encounter, they're looking over here. Thank God that you're interrupting their plans. They just stopped, they, they just thought they stopped at a red light, you know, a traffic light. They, they actually stopped because God wanted to speak in their life and change their life. Because that's what he does. You see, maybe it's the fact that, you know, you know, God's interrupted your plans to volunteer for a need at church. Some of you have been in that case. Maybe he's stirring your heart on this. Maybe he's doing that now to, 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 for you to be able to help people know God, find hope, and to make a difference. Maybe he's interrupting your, your plans to, for you to check on a friend in need to help and assist them somehow. Maybe, maybe he's interrupting your plans to finally challenge you, make, for you to finally take that step to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life today. So I don't know what your plans are, but I know this, that when he interrupts our, our, interrupts our plans, he always has something greater or better he wants to do within our life. Amen. Amen. So Mary, she's confused, she's disturbed, she's trying to figure out what the angel could mean. In Luke chapter 1, verse 30, it says, Don't be afraid, or fear not, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. I don't know about you, but I like God's favor on my life. Because when God's favor is working in your life, you can do things. See, God can do things in and through your life that you can't do on your own. Amen? And for Mary to, uh, to really get and understand the fact that, Mary, this is not about you and your ability and your talent and what you can do. This is about what God can do through you, his favor flowing through your life, his favor moving your life. See, he does things in and through our lives that we can't do by ourselves. I know I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for his favor today. But we take that step despite the fear. The Passion Translation says it this way, do not yield to fear. Because it really, what it is, it's a yielding to the fear. It's giving up, giving in to the fear that's trying to rule our life. He says, do not yield to the fear, Mary, for the Lord has found delight in you and has chosen to surprise you with a wonderful gift. And the second thing I want to talk about this is that, you know, the first one is that, hey, you know, God's plans many times come into our life. There are interruptions to our plans, but they're actually really invitations. The second thing is that God's purpose is often different than what we have planned. That his purpose is often different than, than what our plans are. And in verse 31, he goes on in Luke 1, it says, you, have, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You will name his name, you will, you, will name, uh, sorry, you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So she was chosen to be the mother of the Son of God. That's huge. It's like, wow. She's thinking, you know, Mary had to be on this roller coaster of emotions when you think about it. She's like, wow, I'm going to give birth to the Son of God. That's amazing. And then, wait a second. Hold on. Wow. It is illegal to be pregnant out of wedlock and punishable by sin. By and punish that sin is punishable by stoning. Wow. That's another wow. A different wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big another wow, okay? You know, she's thinking, what am I going to say? What are they, what are they, what's everybody going to say about me? Oh, come on, you know how people talk. See, the, the same, it hasn't, nothing's changed. Mary's thinking, the first thing is, what are they going to say about me? They're all going to talk about me. They're all going to say that, you know, that, oh, well, no, if God spoke to me and it's the Holy Spirit, they're like, yeah, sure, Mary, you know, what are you eat? Are you eating the horse's oats or something? What, what's going on there? You, you know, what's going on there? You know, what, what are my parents going to think? What is Joseph going to think? And so we see all these different things and scenarios. And I love Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. It says this. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. 
and my ways are far beyond anything that you could ever imagine. In other words, I can't figure it all out. I've had to learn that the steps, whenever God has led in my life and challenged myself personally or ministry-wise, I can't, fi- I, you know, as a person who likes to figure it out all the way to the end, I can't figure it out all, out all the way to the end. And that's the part that I have to trust. My mind says, logically, we need to figure this all out so we can calculate the steps and know where we're going. Faith says, no, 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 I'm just giving you a little bit to get you from here to there. I'll tell you the rest on the next part. And for some of us, that's really hard because you don't think like that, you don't operate like that, but God's saying, trust me, because that's what faith is. Faith is trust, to take that step. When, when those people at Ringling Brothers and Barley Baby Circus were putting that harness on me and hooking up a, a, a cable to God knows where on the back of our neck and pushing up on, us on top of these massive horses, <laughs> yeah, it was quite an interesting sight. We do have a, I wish I had, we have a picture somewhere, I just don't know where it is and push us up on top of that, I had no other choice but to trust that these people that I don't even know and the lawyers that I just signed off my life to, that I'm gonna be okay. My wife is gonna be, the, 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 the mother of my child is gonna be okay. I can't even see her because she's behind me on another horse. She wasn't even behind me. She was, I don't know, she was somewhere on another horse. And so anyways... It's that trust that, God, you've got this. Verse 9 says, For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. In other words, when you think, so I never really thought about this way. When you think, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, it sounds very poetic, but what he's saying is, here you are on earth, and look up. How far is heaven from where we're standing right now? How far is the solar system? How far is the moon? How far is the sun? He goes, as far as those things are separated is how different my ways and my thinking is from your ways and your thinking. So we have to put it in, so sometimes we have to stop and really reread to figure out what he's actually saying. He's saying, my, my, my thoughts, my, my thinking, what I do, my decisions are so big or so much more. If you compare you standing on planet earth and the sun up there in the sky and the heavens above you, how far that is, that's how different we both think. I think from how God thinks. And that is what he's saying is, that's the part. He says, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. See, usually his interruptions don't make sense to us. My plans were, and I just, I've been a lot of reflection actually this weekend. When it, when it hit me the date and all this like that, I was like, wow, this is the same weekend that my dad died, massive heart attack right before service. Yeah, that brings back a lot of memories. It's been a long time, but still, those memories come back. Those moments still come back. And, and so I had that, and then, of course, I'm teaching on this this weekend for the next couple of weeks. And, <clears throat> and I started thinking about it, and it wasn't just the fact of his death, but how that my plans completely changed. My life completely you know, was solely different. You know, my plans are so different after God interrupted my life. You know, I don't know your story, but I can show you my story, and it was the fact that you know, at this point right now in life, if I, if I was doing my plans, I'd be completely fluent in Spanish because I, I mentioned earlier, I was going to, I was, well, literally I was going to Costa Rica for, you know, anywhere from four to six months to a school down there. I was going to learn Spanish. I had always wanted to be fluent in it and I, I would have been fluent. I wouldn't be struggling like I am right now. But I would have been fluent in Spanish. I would have had my pilot's license, probably working for a missionary organization in Central and South America. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I, I felt that my direction was and what I, my, those were my plans of what I wanted to do. And so then God interrupts and he invites me to become a pastor at 21 years old, which is kind of crazy in its sense right there because when I look at most 21 years old, I'm like, how in the world did I ever do that? <laughs> because that was me at one time. You know, as I said, I'm still struggling to be fluent in Spanish. Maybe one day, possibly, I'll be able to complete that pilot's license. I don't know. I started it, but never get my solo out in to be able to fly solo. But he's kept me at the same church for all these years, despite me wanting to walk away in times of hurt and being wounded and disappointment. He always brought me back. He always said, no, 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 I'm not done with you yet. Just, you know, put your big boy pants on and come back over here, all right? I've seen God do incredible things in so many people's lives over all these years. I mean, I can't even, could, if I wanted to write a book, I couldn't even start to begin to see how many things that God has done. And I'm not saying because of me, I was a part of what he was doing. 
but the ability to see God do miracles in people's lives, to literally change circumstances and situations, as to see people that are, have been broken and busted and lives completely destroyed and yet turn around. When I, to see someone like, um, um, you know, people that had come in and to see how that they struggled and even, even people from other countries and, and, and just had they come in here and like you know, had a passion to do this or do that. And, um, like Ijeoma, I always think of Ijeoma, those of you that know her. I remember the day that she walked in here and she you know, we came up on this, I think it was right over here and we prayed. And she was just, you know, she wanted to go to school, but she didn't have the money to do it. And, you know, she was a single mom and her kids and all these things like that, struggling. We prayed. And I said, Ijeoma, God is going to be able to do, he's going to make a way. I don't know how, but he's got a passion in you. And anyone that knows Ijeoma now, she, her, her kids are doing great. I mean, she's raised her, you know, her kids and they're, they're, they're great. And she's, and now she, you know, she's a nurse. She's, I mean, she's more than just a nurse. I think mean, she kept taking all these things. And every time she came back from prayer, it was like, well, yeah, I'm just believing God for money to be able to take this course and do that. And the idioma that walked in that door many, many years ago and the idioma that's here today is so miraculously different because of God that when he interrupts your plans, and for me, I love seeing that. For me, I've had the privilege because you know what? That builds my faith. That challenges and stretches my faith because that's the God that we see. That's what God does within our life. And, so he, and he's placed me in the company of some incredibly amazing men and women that, that lead in this ministry. And some, some have titles and some don't have titles, but they're incredible people. I mean, to be around that, people that are so much smarter than me, to be honest, I'll be totally honest, they're smarter than me. You know, I just try to look smart. You know, there's, they are really smart. I'm like, yeah, go ahead, do it. Yeah, I'm just like, because I don't have a clue how to do it. You do it, you know? You know, but have the understanding that I don't have to know it all. I can't know it all. And that's why God puts people in our life. And I go back and I look and, and I, I think about how that, you know, outside of all the things that we've done locally as a church, how that God connected me with people from so many different countries that enabled us as a church to help change lives completely around this planet. Here, I was just looking to be able to do some stuff in Central and South America. And I started thinking about this. I was thinking about this yesterday. I kind of rewrote a bunch of stuff last night. I was thinking about it and I was just like, God, the people that you put in my life that gave us as a church the opportunity to change their life, like the, like the church in Indonesia. When you know, we were there, I spoke at, as in Bali a, a couple years ago and they invited me to speak there and I went and I spoke and the people were all crammed in there and you know, and there was people outside. And Bali is a, is a Hindu nation. It's, you know, and it's really strong Hindu. And it's like there's very, the, my, the, the, the Christians that are there are such a small percentage. And yet here's this church, little small church. People are crammed in there. It's hot. They got fans that are doing absolutely nothing for anybody. So, I mean, we're just about ready to pass out inside there. Thank God we didn't. I didn't. But, you know, and, and there's people outside that are looking in the windows and listening. And I went to the pastor afterwards. I was like, hey, you know, you ever thought about like kind of pushing this wall out over here? He goes, yeah, actually, we're trying to do it right now. And he showed me, he says, this is the perimeter, but we just, we just can't do it right now. And I said, well, why? He said, well, you know, we don't have the money to do it and all the things like that. And I came back here. I asked you guys, I said, hey, you know, can we just help this church? And, you know, we took up, you guys just gave 2000 over $2,000. I think we ended up giving like three or something like that. But it was a couple years ago. But, and they were able to knock that wall down, build that up, bought instruments for the, the worship team, put some speakers in the back part of that little building in, in, a, in, a, in a country that is a Hindu-dominated country. And it would have taken them 10 years to be able to do it, what we did in one Sunday. You change lives. And that was just, you know what? That was from a conversation with a friend of mine that lives in Australia. And... I connected with the, and Nala is the, is the pastor there, this guy Nala and his wife in Indonesia, and I ended up talking to him, and he's like, hey, if you come over here, I would love for you to speak. And so we did, and God did that, and we as a church enabled a church over there in a nation that is not even a Christian nation to be able to do something that we'd never have been able to do in a decade. And we did it at one Sunday. That's what God does when he interrupts your plans. And I started thinking about that and I looked at all the different places and there's more, I just what I can think of, but as a church, we've been able to reach out into Russia, Ukraine, the Philippines, Turkey, Guatemala, Panama, Belize, Bangladesh, India, Kenya, Nigeria, Bhutan, Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Indonesia, and just recently, we're gonna help them this, this month uh, as, as a guy that I met when I was in Chile. 
And he's, he wasn't working as a pastor, but now he is a co-pastor with church, a new church plant that they're doing on one of the most remote islands in the world. That's Rapa Nui in Chile, which is also called Isla de Pascua, um, Easter Island. And they started a brand new church. And over the, I was just talking to him just the other day. And he says, I think it was, I forgot how many they baptized um, like last month. And now they have about another 10 or 20 people they're baptizing <clears throat> on a, in a nation that is basically, uh, that's the big Moais that they have and they worship. It's ancestral worship and all these different things. But people are, are coming to Jesus Christ on that nation and giving their life to Jesus. And they do all the songs. <clears throat> They do the, the preaching, the Rapa Nui language. They do the songs. They're all Rapa Nui songs. They've reached out to the culture that is there, and the people are just coming and making Jesus Christ Lord of their life. It, every week just keeps growing and growing and growing. And you are doing that. We are doing that together. And I started thinking about that. I was like, wow. You know, his purposes were so much bigger than my plans. And I am so grateful that I followed his plans. Amen? Amen? His plans are always bigger than our plans. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, <clears throat> plans to give you a hope and a future. In verse 34, Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I am a virgin. It, it can't happen. It's impossible. It's absurd. Don't understand how. Maybe you don't understand how your marriage is going to make it. Maybe you don't understand how you're gonna, your, your wounds are going to be healed. Maybe you don't understand how you're going to pay your bills or how to survive this storm. But what I do know is this. <clears throat> God is in the business of the impossible. And I'm not just trying to hype you up. I, I've seen it over and over. <clears throat> in verse 35, it says, The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and will be called the son of God for nothing, nothing is impossible with, with God. So maybe you're looking at the things that, that you say are impossible, but with God, say this with me, but with God, all things are possible. I need to know that. That God, what I may be seeing right now, you have a way. It may not be exactly as I'm planning it to be, but he does make a way. I threw this last scripture in here as we start to close. It's Isaiah 43, 19. It says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? In other words, can't you see it? I will even, I love this. And I, you know, I've loved this verse on this. And this is the part that I love about it because this talks about the impossibility aspect. And what, what, God, what Isaiah is speaking to the people of that time, God is still the same God that is speaking the same thing to us in this time. And he says this, I will even make a road in the wilderness, a way in the wilderness. That's huge. You know, to make a road where there is no road is difficult. We don't think about that. We've got roads all over the place. If you go into a, a dense forest or a dense jungle, if you look at how long it took him to build the Panama Canal or other major highways and uh, the, the, the highways that go through the Rocky Mountains, it wasn't just like, oh, let's just make a road. No, you're talking about years of work and labor and toil and all kind of things. God says, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. To do what? To do what it is that he wants to do in your life. God is still putting roads in your wilderness and he's still putting rivers in your desert. He is still doing the impossible today. What is it that God's asking you to do or believe? I believe that God is not silent. Only ask, he will let us know. And it may be forgiving. It may be healing a rift. It may be initiating restoration. It may be changing a relationship. It may be making that call that you to keep avoiding to do. It may be leading a circle group. It may be you just stop running from what it is that God wants to do in your life. I don't know what it is, but I want to tell you something that changed my life drastically. I'm going to finally close with this. And that is this. If God is asking you to take a step of faith, you need to make sure that you know this. And this was a lesson. It took me a while to learn this lesson. When I did, it changed my perspective and what I do ministry-wise. And it's very simple, that the outcome is God's responsibility. Obedience is my responsibility. Amen. The outcome's not your responsibility. For years, I was trying to take people through the whole process in their life. And when they would crash and burn, man, it was a, it was a knife to my heart until one time I heard, realized the fact is that, you know what? 
outcome is not my responsibility. I can only give you what I have to give you. It's your responsibility what you do with what I give you. I've shared that with my kids. I've had those very candid conversations with, as a parent, sometimes we want to we wanna helicopter hover, you know, until they're like 60 years old. And, you know, hopefully not. Some of you are like, cut that string. That umbilical cord got cut a long time ago. It's still cut, okay? But see, I, you know, I, I told Brittany and Andrew both, I said, listen, you know, as you get older, you're gonna, you know, I, I, over the years, I've, I've been letting the, letting the rope out, you know? Letting the, the, not, the leash sounds bad. But I grew up with dogs, so that's why I always use leash, but it's not, I don't really mean that. Or rope is not the best illustration either, but, but those ties and, uh, you know, giving them the ability to, to step out and do things and make mistakes. And I've said to them very much over the, over the time, like I said, I said I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pour into you everything that I have, give you what I have, the tools that I have. It's your responsibility to take them and do something with them. And guaranteed, you will hurt me at different times along the way by doing something that I told you not to do, that you shouldn't do, that it's gonna have a problem, something to do. But ultimately, I'm not, responsibility, I'm not responsible for the decisions and choices you make. It will hurt me, but you will bear the brunt of the responsibility for the decisions that you make in your life. So think before you take a step. Think before you do something stupid. I'm talking about what I told them. And I'll say to you too, think before you do something stupid, okay? Because when you're trying to help, and as, a, as a pastor, as a church, and helping someone, it, it, the responsibility is for us to obey. God's responsibility is to take care of a person's life to work in their life. And he will do that as long as their life is open to do that. But that when I understand that outcome is God's responsibility, we're asking, well, how's it gonna happen? How and when and how much? That's outcome, that's God. I can't control that. All I can control is the fact that I take the step of faith and obey. That I just surrender my life to God like that young little girl named Mary that said, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true remember who you are and whose you are today that's what she did father i thank you today let your word just challenge us today as we continue this over the next two weeks but the opportunity to look at fear not dominating our life and the opportunity to take that step of faith whatever it is that you're stirring in our heart to do whatever it is that you're prodding and saying, listen, just take this step. I know it's not in your plans. I know you didn't schedule it, but take the step and trust me that I'll take you the rest of the way. Father, let us have that faith to do that. Have the faith to be able to put our life in your hands to know that you will make roads in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, have an amazing week. We'll pick this up next week. If you need prayer, of course, we're here. Pastor Peter had one quick thing he wanted to say. So for those of you here, for those of you watching, we'll see you next week. But for those of you here, just hang on a sec. God bless you. Love you guys. If you need prayer, we'll help here. God bless. Fighting for my victory Caught in your flesh and bones